Hey guys, it's Libby, and today I want to do a sort of, um, I guess it's an introductory video um, to my Taming of the Shrew video, which I'm doing for the Bard Book Club later this month. And what I want to do here is delve into a particular passage from Act 2, Scene 1, that I think is especially hard for modern, for modern readers to understand because of how much equivocation and, like, Elizabethan punnage there is going on. And if you watch a production of Shrew on stage, or if you're reading a text without any notes, I think you're going to be completely lost. And if you're reading a text that does have notes, well, they'll be boring and I will be more fun. So what I'm going to do is go through the first conversation that Patricio and Catherine have in the play and explain all of the equivocation. Um, if you don't know what equivocation is, um, it's used when a word has multiple meanings and in a conversation it's been established that we're using it in one of those senses, um, but then someone changes it to another of those senses. It's basically a pun. In my Yale edition, I'm going to be starting at Act 2, Scene 1, Line um, 182. However, since there's a lot of prose in this text, your mileage on what line it is may vary. Um, just know it's after the exit of Baptista. Um, Petruchio is left alone on stage and he delivers a soliloquy starting with, pray you do, I will attend her here. Um, and then Catherine enters. That's where I'm going to start. I will leave a link in the description to um, an online version of this text so that you can find it even if you don't um, have a copy yourself. So, Petruchio starts when Catherine enters by saying, Good morrow, Kate, for that's your name, I hear. No trouble there. Catherine responds, Well, have you heard but something hard of hearing? They call me Catherine, that do talk of me. Um, Petruchio then says, You lie in faith, for you are called plain Kate and bonnie Kate and sometimes Kate the cursed, but Kate, the prettiest Kate in Christendom, Kate of Kate Hall. Kate Hall, according to my uh, Yale edition, uh, the note given for what Kate Hall is, is um, St. Catherine's Hall, which is in uh, the College of Cambridge. Um, I don't don't know if that's supposed to have any particular meaning. Um, my super dainty Kate, for dainties are all Kates, and therefore Kate, take this of me, Kate, of my consolation, hearing thy mildness praised in every town, thy virtues spoke of, and thy beauty sounded, yet not so deeply as to thee belongs, myself am moved to woo thee for my wife. So moved is the first word that Catherine is going to latch on to and um, start twisting his meaning around. But then of course Petruchio is going to twist her meaning right back. So Petruchio is using moved to mean sort of emotionally inspired to woo her for his wife. And then Catherine hears this and she says, moved in good time. Let him that moved you hither remove you hence. I knew you at the first, you were a movable. And what a movable is, is a piece of furniture. Um, Petruchio, presumably playing dumb, says, why, what's immovable? Catherine, instead of giving him a definition, gives him an example. She says, a joint stool, which is sometimes uh, written as a joined stool. Um, and joinery is the practice of carpentry, but without using nails. Um, it's where you sort of carve, like, things that they fit together without nails or glue or anything like that. So she's just saying an example of a piece of furniture is a chair. And Petruchio absolutely runs away with this concept and he says, thou hast hit it, come sit on me. So Catherine has called him a piece of furniture, such as a chair. He says, yes, indeed, I am a chair. Why don't you come sit on me, hun? Um, and Catherine says, asses are made to bear and so are you. Ass here not being used as derriere, um, but as a donkey. So donkeys were made by God, I guess, um, to uh, carry people's stuff around. Um, and you can bear things by carrying them around, or you can bear things by um, like just having their weight be on you. Um, so she says, all right, uh, I will sit on you, but I'm going to call you an ass in the uh, meantime. Petruchio responds, women are made to bear and so are you. He's using another meaning of the word bear, meaning to bear children. And Catherine says, no such jade as you, if me you mean. A jade is a term for a worthless thing. Um, and she, it, it, there's two ways in which she could be using the word bear. So either she is picking up on his use of the word bear, meaning to bear children, and she was she's saying, I would not bear a jade, meaning a child, like 
you, meaning like that you were the father of, um, basically I'm not gonna have sex with you, and the other context is also her saying I'm not gonna have sex with you, um, uh, in the context of bearing a man on top of you whilst lying in bed doing just, I cannot even imagine what, I'm gonna have to be pretty straightforward here guys, this, uh, this video is not for children, and my uh, forthcoming Taming of the Shrew video will also definitely not be for children. Um, okay, so Catherine will not bear a jade such as him. Petruchio then says, Alas, good Kate, I will not burden thee for knowing thee to be but young and light. And then Catherine cuts him off with, Too light for such a swain as you to catch, and yet as heavy as my weight should be. Now, the word light is being used in three different senses here. Petruchio uses it once, and then Catherine uses it, and then she realizes that she's kind of messed up, and she switches to use it in a third way. Um, so Petruchio starts off by saying, I will not burden thee, meaning I will not lie on top of you, um, and uh, for knowing thee to be but young and light, meaning sort of carefree, youthful, I'm not going to tie you down. And Catherine's like, oh no, you're not going to tie me down, for I am too light for such a swain as you to catch. And then she realizes that she made a mistake, because she wants to use it as in, uh, you know, able to like float up to the sky like a balloon, um, but it also means loose sexually available. Um, so she says, although I am light, I am as heavy as my weight should be. I am not that loose. Don't you try to pull a pun on this one. Um, and then Petruchio comes out with a very strange line, should be, should buzz. At the time that Shakespeare was writing, buzz was a type of filler word used the way we might say, hmm, now. And buzzing then, as now, is also a sound that bees make. So I think he's saying, should be, bee has two different meanings, to be and the insect that makes honey. Uh, buzz, did I do it? Um, uh, and then Catherine responds, well tan and like a buzzard. Tan being um, a contraction of taken. So well taken and like a buzzard. Um, well taken meaning well understood or well put, um, and like a buzzard, she is using the word buzzard in three different senses. One is the sort of thing that would make the sound buzz, as he has just done. Two is as the uh, bird, which Petruchio is going to play with later. And three is uh, to mean an idiot. Um, people would call people the name of the bird, which I guess they thought it was a stupid bird, in order to call people an idiot. Um, so Petruchio picks up on this meaning of buzzard the bird, and he says, Oh, slow-winged turtle, shall a buzzard take thee? Turtle here means turtle dove, which is a sort of attractive um, bird, and then a buzzard is kind of a, an ugly bird. I think they're like vulture-like, they're like bald on top. So he's saying, um, he's turning up the romance quite a bit. Um, oh, you are so beautiful, you are a slow-winged turtle, will you accept me, this buzzard, as your spouse. Um, so shall a buzzard take thee, is his, is, are his exact words. And Catherine says, I, for a turtle, as he takes a buzzard. So Catherine um, has changed the meaning of take thee, meaning so that it doesn't mean take thee in marriage, but understand you as. So she's saying, if I am a turtle dove, then understand me to be a turtle dove, as you would understand a buzzard to be a buzzard. O slow, slow winged turtle, shall a buzzard take the eye for a turtle as he takes a buzzard. Then Petruchio changes tack and drops this whole bird allegory that they've got going on and says, come, come, you wasp, in faith you are too angry. And Catherine says, if I be waspish, which is a hard word to say, best beware my sting. My remedy is then to pluck it out. I, if the fool could find it where it lies, who knows not where a wasp does be, does wear his sting in his tail? Catherine says it's in his tongue. I think this part is a fairly um, self-explanatory metaphor in which Catherine is being compared to a wasp. Um, there's not a lot of equivocation going on. Um, so Petruchio uh, starts playing dumb again, and he says, "Whose tongue?" Uh, and Catherine thinks she has won and would like to exit the conversation now. So she says, yours if you talk of tales, and so farewell. 
Um, so I've seen um, the phrase talk of tales printed in two different ways. One of them, which is here, is talk of T-A-L-E-S, so talk of stories, and this is um, the, an Elizabethan way of saying to like sort of say nothing. So she's saying, if you're not going to say anything, I'm going to stop this conversation, goodbye. Um, you, I've also seen it printed as if you talk of T-A-I-L-S, which is not an equivocation on the way tales had been used earlier, it's being used in the same way. Um, and in that case, uh, it means if you're going to start talking about tales, meaning the but, uh, then I'm going to leave because I am well-bred. Um, and uh, Petruchio <laughs> then gives us this humdinger. This is why this video is not for children. It's not my fault, it's Shakespeare's fault. What? With my tongue in your tail. Nay, come again, good Kate. I am a gentleman. And thus we have one of the earliest references to analingus in English literature. I don't know if it has been referenced before. I have not scoured old texts looking for this, but I'd be curious if you have. Let me know. So, uh, uh, so now Petruchio has brought up the word gentleman, which is the next word that they're going to play with. It can be used to either mean a gentleman, meaning a man who is like considerate, um, or uh, the rank of gentlemen, which is sort of below the aristocracy, but still fairly high up. Um, gentlemen had coats of arms, um, and I, most of them, uh, I think, did not work for a living. They were members of the gentry. Um, so he says, uh, I am a gentleman. She says, that I'll try, and she hits him. Basically saying, I will test to see if you really are a gentleman uh, by seeing how you react to me hitting you. Um, he does not react by hitting her, which technically means he still qualifies as a gentleman, but he does say, I swear I'll cuff you if you strike again. So he threatens her with hitting her. Uh, uh, and then this means she's able to pull out the line, so may you lose your arms. If you strike me, you are no gentleman, and if no gentleman, why then no arms? Arms here is being used to refer to a coat of arms. Um, so she's saying, um, you, so may you lose your arms. At first, it seems like it's kind of a threat that like, if he hits her, she will yank his arms off. Um, but then she <laughs> softens it uh, by saying, if you hit me, then you are no gentleman, meaning if you hit me, then you are not um, a, a polite, well brought up man. Uh, but then she changes it to say, and if no gentleman, now using it to mean someone with a coat of arms. Why then? No arms. Petruchio picks up on her talk of coat of arms and says, a herald, Kate, O, oh, put me in thy books. Now a herald is the sort of person whose job it is to um, keep track of um, coats of arms and other elements of heraldry, which are the, the various forms of insignia for um, wealthy and landed families. Um, so he's saying, if you know so much about heraldry, put me in your books, meaning your book of heraldry, but also sort of th think about me, potentially saying like, write about me in your diary. Um, uh, and Catherine's like, okay, uh, we can do this. I think she wanted to leave earlier, but, but this is just too tempting of a line. Um, so she says, oh, what is your crest? A coxcomb. So um, the crest is part of this heraldic insignia. Um, and she says, is it a coxcomb? Which um, is the, the comb of a rooster, the bit that goes on his head, um, but is also uh, the, the thing that um, signifies a fool, a court fool. Petruchio says that his crest is a combless cock, so Kate will be my hen. Um, a combless cock meaning a rooster that has had its comb removed, um, potentially uh, by humans. I'm not totally sure what purpose that would serve, although I think you can put them into soups, uh, but also uh, potentially because it was torn off by another rooster in a fight. Um, and so a combless cock is a um, gentle, um, non-aggressive rooster because he's been put in this place by, uh, by his farmer or by some other rooster. And so he's saying, if you will be my hen, if you will marry me and live with me, I will become gentle. Uh, and Catherine responds, no cock of mine, you crow to like a craven. A craven is a coward. And now to address the question that is definitely on your mind, was cock used to refer to a penis at this point in the history of the English language? Well, I happen to know about this uh, quite a bit. So the word cock, first, <laughs> I'm sorry. So the word cock meaning 
penis, uh, enters the written history of English a couple of decades after this play is being written in the in the first decade or two of the 16th century. I'm sorry, 17th century. So it's possible that it had entered the spoken language earlier and they are also talking about that, but that's a bit of a stretch. It's a little too much time. Um, unless Shakespeare is very forward thinking with his vocabulary, which he kind of was, um, but I think, you know, 30, 20, 30 years is a little bit too much to not have any other written records of it. So unfortunately, they're probably not doing any dick jokes right now. I'm so sorry. But if you're doing a modern production, that is what your audience will be thinking, so I'd say lean into it. Um, Okay, now we change topic again. Petruchio says, come, Kate, come. You must not look so sour. She says, it is my fashion when I see a crab. Um, crab here is short for crab apple, which is a sour type of apple. She's saying, when I see a sour apple, I'm worried about it tasting bad, and so I make a pouty face. Um, Petruchio says, why, here's no crab, and therefore look not sour. To which she responds, there is, there is. Petruchio, keeping up his playing dom bruise, says, then show it me. And Catherine says, had I a glass, I would. Glass meaning mirror. Uh, basically saying, I can't show you the crab apple that I'm seeing because you can't see your own face without a mirror, and I don't have a mirror. Uh, Petruchio uh, finally picks up on this and says, what you mean my face? Uh, and Catherine says, well aimed of such a young one. Um, well aimed meaning sort of well understood. You have you have thrown your dart and you have uh, hit the nail on the head. Lots of metaphors going on. Uh, you have figured out this complex thing that I was trying to say. Well done, Petruchio. Uh, although she does not know his name yet, interestingly. Um, uh, Petruchio then says, now by St. George, I am too young for you, and Catherine says, yet you are withered, and I think this is the first chance you have, I mean maybe you can manufacture one earlier, uh, but this is the first chance where the text really wants you to have a kind of romantic moment between these two. Um, so uh, she's she's basically trying to say he's ugly, um, saying he looks old, yet you are withered. Petruchio says, oh tis with cares, meaning I'm not old, I've just had a kind of stressful life, and that's why I'm all wrinkly and gray. Um, and Catherine responds with, I care not, which is a really bad comeback. And uh, I like to think that it's because um, she's like, oh, he's sad. Um, uh, and that's why she can't really come up with something good to say in response. You'll also notice that um, the meter of this line is a little bit funky. Um, there's, there's three different exchanges that could fill out this whole line of iambic pentameter. So it's, yet you are with the tis with cares, I care not. So the not is really sticking out in this line. You could totally have the line which would have a different meaning, that is, yet you are withered, tis with cares, I care. And you could play it where that is what it seems like she is going to say, and then she comes out with not, or even not. Also notice that they are sharing the third foot in the line. Um, the first foot is yet you, the second is are we, uh, the third is, it's hard to say, third tis. So there's a kind of textual intimacy there whenever you have people um, not only filling out each other's lines but filling out each other's feet. Um, if you have no idea what I was just talking about, go check out my video on meter uh, and verse in Shakespeare. Okay, um, Catherine has perhaps just admitted that she uh, cares about him a little bit, uh, and that she wants to get out of here. Um, so uh, but it's, there isn't a stage direction. Presumably she gets up to leave or starts walking away. Petruchio says, Nay, hear you, Kate, in sooth you scape not so. Um, basically, don't leave. Catherine says, I chafe you if I tarry, let me go. 
And then Petruchio does what he said he was going to do in his soliloquy before Catherine entered, which was basically um, gaslight her. Anything that she does, he will say uh, that she's doing the opposite. Um, so, no, not a whit, I find you passing gentle. T'was told me you were rough and coy and sullen, and now I find report a very liar. For thou art pleasant, gamesome, passing courteous, but slow in speech, yet sweet as springtime flowers. Thou canst not frown, thou canst not look askance, nor bite the lip as angry wenches will, nor hast thou pleasure to be cross in talk, but thou with mildness entertains thy wooers with gentle conference, soft and affable. Why does the world report that Kate doth limp? O oh, slanderous world, Kate, like the hazel twig, is straight and slender and as brown in hue as hazelnuts and sweeter than the kernels. O oh, let me see thee walk, thou dost not halt. So presumably there is a refined, graceful way for ladies to walk. Um, I, if you want to see an example of that, um, investigate um, Mark Rylance's um, productions of Shakespeare, uh, which he he does what's called original practice style, um, which is as close to what the original productions would look like. So he's got all male casts, um, the, he, the, he's, the movement is what it would have been like. I don't think he does original pronunciation, um, but in, in every other way it's as close as you can get. Um, and you can see him and the other actors uh, who are playing women walking in this sort of way. But Catherine presumably does not walk like that, she stomps around. Um, so Catherine says, go fool and whom thou keepst, command, whom thou keeps, meaning um, the servants who attend you, um, and she says, go command them, stop commanding me to walk. Petruchio says, did Diane ever, or did ever Diane so become a grove as Kate to this chamber with her princely gait? Oh, be thou Diane, and let her be Kate, and then let Kate be chaste and Diane sportful. Diane referring to Diana or Artemis, the virginal goddess of the hunt, um, and he's saying that she, he, Catherine, is even more graceful than Diana. It seems like Catherine doesn't really have a good comeback here, and she says, where did you study all this goodly speech? And he says, it is extempore from my mother wit. Mother wit meaning sort of native wit, his, um, his natural ability to make puns. Um, but Catherine uses the term uh, witty, uh, uh, mother wit in a different way, and she says, ah, a witty mother, witless else her son. Basically, oh, you inherited your wit from your mother, otherwise you would be um, witless. Um, on the one hand, can mean not able to perform wit, but it can also mean, like, not able to function. Um, Petruchio says, am I not wise? Uh, and she says, yes keep you warm. And her final attempt at a parting phrase, keep you warm, is a reference to the expression to have wit enough to keep warm, meaning to like be smart enough to be able to like basically function in life, to, to keep yourself warm um, as opposed to cold and dead like a corpse. Uh, you know, you've, you are able to stay alive. Congratulations, you've hit square one. And um, Petruchio's like, oh, we want to talk about keeping warm, do we? I got a pun on this one. Mary, so I mean, sweet Catherine, in thy bed, and therefore setting all this chat aside, thus in plain terms. So finally, <laughs> what have they been talking about for the last 10 minutes? Petruchio is going to say, okay, enough equivocation. Here's what's actually going to happen. So now we've gotten through that. Congratulations, you are now one of the very few people who can actually understand what's happening in that scene. Um, which brings us to the problem of this scene. So I've seen Taming of the Shrew on stage once, and I've seen the um, Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor film of it as well. Um, and the, the problem that directors have is that this is a very verbal scene that your audience is not going to understand. You just have to accept that you, most of your audience is going to have no idea what is happening for 10 minutes of your play. And so what most directors do is um, distract with slapstick. So even if you don't know, um, you know what they're saying, you can understand that like there's some cleverness going on and some adversity based on the cleverness of like how they're, I don't know, grappling with each other or twirling each other around. And I gotta say, I don't like this 
but I don't really have a solution. I mean, you, we could just like have someone come out at the beginning of every production of Taming of the Shrew and do what I just did and say like, you're about to do something really confusing. Here's what everything means. That is not going to happen. Because I think that turning this really clever piece of writing into a fight sequence is basically undermining everything. It's undermining how intelligent these two people are. I really think the reason Catherine has such a terrible relationship with everyone else in her life is that no one gets her. She's being hilarious all of the time and everyone's just like, ugh, what a mouthy woman. And so she's not actually able to communicate in a way that she's good at communicating in, and so she res instead responds physically. She responds violently. Earlier in the scene, we just saw her, like, tie up her sister and shove her around. And this scene needs to sharply contrast to that, because Catherine has finally found someone who actually understands what she's saying and can play the game as well as she can, and so she does not have to react physically. Also, Petruchio is about to do a lot of really terrible things to her in Act 4, and I don't want to start with the fighting. I really want their relationship to be as minimally physical as possible. And when I do my video on the play as a whole, we will talk about ways to deal with the fact that this is a play about torture and domestic abuse. So what I'd like to do to close out the video is give you a sense of what the pacing would be like and sort of, um, it, I think it's helpful to understand the grammar if you can hear where the emphasis is put. So I'm going to do this whole scene again um, with no interruptions, so I'm not going to explain any of the words. I'm also not going to indicate which is uh, a Catherine line and which is a Petruchio line. Um, you can follow along uh, in a text if you would like. Um, but I, I think it's pretty obvious who's speaking. Um, uh, one thing that will help you is that Petruchio refers to Catherine as the, um, which is uh, uh, the informal, and Catherine refers to Petruchio as you, which is the formal. Um, if this sounds totally boring to you, then uh, thank you for watching, and I will see you in my next video. But for those of you who would like to see uh, my rendition of, of this scene, uh, here we go. Enter Catherine. Good morrow, Kate, for that's your name, I hear. Well, have you heard, but something hard of hearing. They call me Catherine, that do talk of me. You lie in faith, for you are called plain Kate, and bonnie Kate, and sometimes Kate the cursed, but Kate, the prettiest Kate in Christendom, Kate of Kate Hall, my super dainty Kate, for dainties are all Kates, and therefore, Kate, take this of me, Kate of my consolation, hearing thy mildness praised in every town, thy virtue spoke of, and thy beauty sounded, yet not so deeply as to thee belongs, myself am moved to woo thee for my wife. Moved. In good time. Let him that moved you hither remove you hence. I knew you at the first. You were a movable. Why? What's a movable? A joined stool? Thou hast hit it. Come, sit on me. Asses are made to bear, and so are you. Women are made to bear, and so are you. No such jade as you, if me you mean. Alas, good Kate, I will not burden thee. For knowing thee to be but young and light, too light for such a swain as you to catch, and yet as heavy as my weight should be, should be, should buzz, well tan and like a buzzard. O oh, slow-winged turtle, shall a buzzard take thee? I, for a turtle as he takes a buzzard. Come, come, you wasp. If faith you are too angry, if I be waspish, best beware my sting. My remedy is then to pluck it out. I, if the fool could find it where it lies, who knows not where a wasp does wear his sting? In his tail, in his tongue. Whose tongue? Yours, if you do talk of tails, and so farewell. What? With my tongue in your tail? Nay, come again. Good Kate, I am a gentleman. That I'll try. I swear I'll cuff you if you strike again, so may you lose your arms. If you strike me, you are no gentleman, and if no gentleman, why then? No arms. A herald, Kate, oh, put me in thy books. What is your crest? A coxcomb, a combless cock, so Kate will be my hen. No cock of mine, you crow to like a craven. Nay, come, Kate, come, you must not look so sour. It is my fashion when I see a crab. Why, here's no crab, and therefore look not sour. There is, there is, then show it me. Had I a glass, I would. Why, what? 
you mean my face. Well aimed of such a young one. Now, by St. George, I am too young for you, yet you are withered. Tis with cares. I care not. Nay, hear you, Kate. In sooth, you scape not so. I chafe you if I tarry. Let me go. No, not a whit. I find you passing gentle. Twas told me you were rough and coy and sullen, and now I find report a very liar. For thou art pleasant, gamesome, passing courteous, but slow in speech, yet sweet as springtime flowers. Thou canst not frown, thou canst not look askance, nor bite the lip as angry wenches will, nor hast thou pleasure to be cross in talk, but thou with mildness entertainst thy wooers, with gentle conference, soft and affable. Why does the world report that Kate doth limp? O oh, slanderous world! Kate, like the hazel twig, is straight and slender, and as brown in hue as hazelnuts, and sweeter than the kernels. Oh, let me see thee walk. Oh, thou dost not halt. Go, fool, and whom thou keep'st, command. Did ever Diane so become a grove as Kate this chamber with her princely gates? Oh, be thou Diane, and let her be Kate, and then let Kate be chaste, and Diane sportful. Where did you study all this goodly speech? It is extempore. From my mother wit, mm, a witty mother, witless else her son. Am I not wise? Yes, keep you warm. Marry, so I mean, sweet Catherine, in thy bed. Therefore, setting all this chat aside, thus in plain terms, your father hath consented that you shall be my wife, your dowry agreed on, and will you, nil you, I will marry you. Now, Kate, I am a husband for your turn, for by this light whereby I see thy beauty, thy beauty that doth make me like thee well, thou must be married to no man but me. For I am he am born to tame you, Kate, and bring you from a wild Kate to a Kate conformable as other household Kates. Here comes your father. Never make denial. I must and will have Catherine to my wife. Oh, thank you.